searching for the giant flowers. Martina Waldersmuller, beautiful Martina, had already spent some months behind the barbed wire of the god prison when the cheerful federators discovered her little sister, Honeysuckle Rose, living alone at the Blue Swallow Motel. For some inexplicable reason, little Honeysuckle Rose had vaguely understood something of Martina's predicament. Perhaps this vague understanding had come from an infant memory of things said between her long-gone father and mother, for she could clearly imagine Martina's beautiful face framed by a tangle of barbed wire. Every night during her time at the orphanage on Wall Street, she put her older sister's face together, the slightly arched eyebrows, the broad straight nose, the full lips, the wide cheeks with skin stretched and as glossy as the top sides of the leaves of the one tree left standing beside the gully behind the blue swallow. Honeysuckle Rose had been sleeping in one of the motel beds when Martina disappeared. It was possible, the child knew, that the older girl had gone out into the night, as she sometimes did, and had simply not come back. At that stage, Honeysuckle Rose had known little of the world beyond the motel. Paying guests had not stayed in the mustard-coloured rooms for many years. The two girls had lived on a small sunshine pension, which was paid to them in order that they might keep the neon sign lit up. It was a meagre amount, but enough to allow Martina to go out once a week into the city to buy whatever mould, greyed oranges or gluey have-not spread she could find. Sometimes, when she was not too tired, she would tell Honeysuckle Rose about the things she remembered from when she was a small girl, way back when hairy armed truck drivers and freshly married couples paid money to stay a night in one of the rooms. Back then there was cow's milk and animal meat every day, and there were bananas and other foods that made you feel strong and alive, like oatmeal and sultanas and the seeds of big, big flowers, magically called sunflowers. Honeysuckle Rose loved so much to hear about the time when her family had eaten the seeds of giant flowers that, sometimes when she was alone in the motel, she would escape to the gully out back to play a game that she called Searching for the Giant Flowers. Only a child, it is true, could have imagined searching for any flowers in such a place as that gully. Cut six metres or more into solid clay, the gully was filled with dead tree branches, sullage and garbage. Someone had fenced it off at some stage, so that when the stormwater trickle rose to a dirty torrent, no child could fall into the mess and disappear. Honeysuckle Rose, warned often of the hazards of drowning in the gully, had formed the notion that many of the spur zone and children had been lost in there, and on days when she was left alone, it made her lonely for them. There were dead trees clinging to the eroded banks of the gully, and one small live one. There was also a clump of brush, a battered animal hutch of some long distance use, a car tyre and other shattered bits of brittle plastic. Honeysuckle Rose knew them all. The hutch she knew in particular. It was her doll's house. Martina, beautiful Martina, was the one who had made the dolls, warning little Honeysuckle Rose that she must not show them to anyone should anyone ever be in a position to see them. The largest was the length of the child's foot, stuffed with sheeting and covered in an old singlet. Its clothing was pieced together from scraps of pyjama, the hair a cluster of pale lemon wool, and the eyes and mouth embroidered from curtain hemming unpicked from one of the motel rooms. The doll's left arm hung by a thread, and there were no legs, the other dolls were similar, but smaller. One had a head of nylon fabric, her features drawn on with purple felt-tipped pen. She wore a circle of tiny plastic pearls around her neck. Then there was a smaller doll, dressed cleverly in a kind of kimono of cushion fabric. Her inscrutable oriental features had also been drawn on with pen. Two pink dots added to her eastern beauty. The tiniest doll was no more than a small cushion with a head, and it was made from pieces of felt. It was no bigger than the child's middle finger, and it had a minimal face, but no arms or legs. Honeysuckle Rose loved it best. 
When little honeysuckle Rose played her solitary games with Mrs Simpson, Alexandra, Twilight Beauty and Damsel Nymph, for thus were named the rudimentary puppets, jigging them inside the battered hutch by the side of the dreadful gully, the hours passed quickly. She made a bed for the dolls from the dried grasses that grew in clumps from the clay banks. She made a small table from a flat rock, and bowls were improvised from the curved leaves of the one live tree. She spent many hours creating a garden outside the front door of her hutch motel, though she barely knew what a garden was. She made designs from tiny pebbles, sorted and spat on to show their pretty colours. She poked twigs into the dry ground, hoping for the effect of a flower bed. Informed by the faded pictures that hung in the motel rooms, Honeysuckle Rose imagined that a garden was a peculiarly lit-up place, where the sun shone down without the protection of a flight-proof fence. Martina assured Honeysuckle Rose that indeed, once upon a time, there had been no flight-proof fence over the city of Lucky Cola, or the country of Incognita. But sadly, even Martina, who remembered everything, could not remember such a time.